Hi, and welcome to part two of this tutorial where we are modeling the Berlin Holocaust Memorial Museum in a parametric design tool called Grasshopper and Rhino. Um, in part one, which I just finished recording, uh, what we did was we created like a simplified version of the memorial, what is basically a rectangular grid uh, of, of boxes, all of them following this one, um, this one guiding surface that we created here in Rhino. Uh, for part two, I wanted to cover, so that was like more like a warm up, like a basic uh, for way of looking at this monument for beginners. But for this second part, I wanted to perhaps touch on more advanced features and um, try to implement some of the finer details that this monument actually does have in reality. And I think the three ones, the, the, the details that I would like to focus on are going to be first, instead of sticking to a purely rectangular grid of boxes, uh, we're going to try to fit um, this grid to a polygon that represents the site, because the site in the real world is not perfectly horizontal. It's not perfectly square. The second one that I would like to mimic is the fact that um, it's really hard to tell from the photos, but in reality, um, the, the plane in which these blocks are sitting is not perfectly flat, but it also has a little bit of an undulating um, pattern to it. So we can probably, I would like to replicate that also in this model. Um, the third thing that I would like to do is, uh, it's also very hard to see, uh, you can kind of see in this picture here, but the blocks have a little bit of tilting to the sides. It's almost unperceptible, but it's there. I don't know if it's by design or if it's just the fact that it was very difficult to place them perfectly very vertical. Um, so we will make, add some, a little bit of random tilting to these boxes. And finally, what I would like to do is I would like to, um, I would like to implement this effect where, uh, as soon as close as we get to the boundary of the site, some of these blocks start disappearing and that disappearance, that fading is more, um, is more noticeable the closer you get to the site, to the border of the site, okay? So, um, so those are the four advanced features that we're going to add to this uh, model, into this, to this model. So uh, let's get to it, let's get hands on, okay? So the first one we're going to implement here is we're going to fit this grid to a polygon that has a non-rectangular boundary. First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to hide this from the view just because it makes things easier. I'm going to um, turn off this visualization component, this preview component, so that we can see things a bit more transparently. And um, again, just because if this was the real world, the site as the, a boundary would be something that would be fixed and we would not be able to work with parametrically. What I'm going to do is just I'm going to draw some random curve or polyline in this in this boundary, and then I'm going to use that as the site. So that's going to be, for example, this, for example, I don't know. Um, I'm going to take that inside of Grasshopper by double clicking and adding a curve parameter that I'm going to use to, whoop, I'm going to what is it going here? What is going on? I'm going to select this curve and set this curve as the input parameter here. Okay. Now I also, I'm also going to hide it or not. I can hide that later. What I'm going to do is before, um, I, when I create this, all these points, before I start turning them into planes and operating them and generating boxes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to filter all those points and I'm going to remove the ones that fall outside of this curve perimeter. So in order to do that, I'm going to, I'm going to use this component here in within the curve tab and the analysis category, and it's going to be point in curve, which tests a point, whether if it's inside of a closed curve. Um, for that, I'm going to fit all these points. I'm going to fit the curve. And what I get is a list of trues and falses that is very hard to read here because this, um, this data is a tree. It's a data tree. Uh, but, just for the sake of browsing it a little bit. Um, you can see that uh, I get a list of values, zero, 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 that go between zero and two. This is because this component 
uh, instead of just giving us true or false, it gives us numerical values because there, the result can be whether if it's outside, so that's a zero, whether if it's inside, that's a two, or whether if it's exactly on top of the curve. Uh, obviously, that's going to be very hard to do, but sometimes maybe some points will fall exactly on top of the curve within a certain tolerance. Um, so what I want to do now is I want to call, I want to filter this list of points and remove the ones that um, have a zero as part of their, of their containment criteria. In order to filter those points, uh, the ones that are zeros or the ones that are twos, um, we're going to use here from the sets tab, we're going to go to sequences and we're going to use the call pattern component. This component takes a list of whatever, points, data, numbers, and it just removes with a pattern the ones that are, it removes the ones that are false and it keeps the ones that are true or the other way around. I'm actually not sure right now. Um, it just keeps the ones that are, um, it just keeps, it keeps the ones that are true and it removes the ones that are false. Ah, I sh let me just wait, let me just, uh, so zero is outside and those are cold, cold. So those are gone. So zero and because zero is equals to false and everything else equals to true. The ones that are inside are kept. So false means it goes. All right. Yeah. False means. Yeah, but it, isn't that not intuitive? If if you want to call objects, you want to call the one calls the ones that are true. Yeah, true. Remove this component. Remove this point. True. No, it's kind of a uh, unintuitive to me. Is that just me? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, let's go back to this. Um, so I'm going to start from the beginning again. Um, <clears throat> In order to do that, we are, in order to filter the points um, that are falling outside, we're going to go here to the sets tab and we're going to sequence and we're going to go to call pattern. What this component does is it takes a list of whatever, uh, points, data, numbers, surfaces, etc., and then it filters that data by a repeating pattern of trues and false. So all the elements that are false, um, what was it? All the elements that are false are gone and all the elements that are true get to stay inside of this, this filter, all right? Um, the problem is that we have here, we have a list, we don't have, really have trues or falses, we have zeros or twos, but it just so happens that in computer science, when you do translations between numbers and Boolean values, um, the most common conversion between them is that anything that is a zero is considered as false and anything that is not considered, that is not a zero is considered true. So one, two, three, minus one, minus two will be considered true. So this component does that conversion automatically for you. And you can see if I hide all these boxes, you can see that um, this component has filtered and it just keeps all the components all the points that have a flag of two in their uh, as part of their containment. So that's great. So if I filter that, that, and then I plug this in here, then all of my planes are only the ones that are generated by the points that are filtered. And therefore, now I have a pattern or boxes that has been adapted to the boundary conditions of the site. Okay. Good. The next thing that we're going to do um, is we're going to implement this feature where all the boxes, instead of being sitting on a perfectly flat surface, aka the XY plane, uh, we're going to mimic a bit more of the reality of the, the document where the floor is not really even, but it also follows like a very soft undulating surface. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to use a very similar technique to the one that we used to project the points to the surface above, but before creating those planes, we're going to take this family of clean points and we're going to project them to the lower surface and then we will create planes on top of them and then we will feed them, etc., etc. 
So that's going to be super easy to do. I'm going to do just like I did before. I'm going to create like a very softly undulating surface right below this thing. Uh, it's going to be right here. I'm going to create another curve. I'm going to deactivate object snap. I'm going to create another very soft curve, something like this. I don't want the effect to be very dramatic. Okay. I just want it to be very subtle. Uh, I'm a minimalist, you know, so uh, I like things clean and delicate. So I'm going to loft this, surf these two curves, one and two. I'm going to create this other uh, base surface. And here I'm going to bring it in, uh, set one surface, this thing here. I'm going to put it up here and now I'm going to hide it. Actually, I don't need to hide this one because it's going to sit on the base. So that's kind of nice. All right. Um, and um, maybe that can be the ground floor. Yeah, I'm not going to hide that. one. Okay. And then I have all these points that are, have already been filtered. I'm going to turn this off. All these points that have already been filtered by the perimeter of the site. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use just uh, another instance of this component here, the project on points. Um, I'm going to take all these points that are filtered. The direction that I'm going to follow now is going to be um, global negative C. You can see that by default, that's the direction that the component is giving me. Um, but I like things clean. So I'm just going to make sure that it's visual, that it's clear that the direction is minus C. So I'm going to write here a panel with the man values minus one. I'm going to factor that Z vector. And you guys can see that now it's pointing down, zero, zero, minus one. And that's going to be the vector that I use for this projection. I like doing these things because sometimes when you open the definition, if you don't see what's plugged in here, it's very hard to understand what's happening. But if you see that there's a minus one and a Z vector, it's easier to read, right? This is like code. It's like, imagine like a form of like commenting your grasshopper definition is makes it easier to read for other people. And then this is the surface that we're projecting on top. You guys can see now how all the points are on the surface below. And if I use those points now to turn them into planes, you can see that all the blocks are now starting from this bottom surface and they're still reaching all the way up to the pre to the to the to the control surface on top. Okay? So Okay, another thing successfully implemented. All right, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to implement uh, the next uh, detail, the next feature of the model, which is going to be that each one of the blocks has a small tilt. It's very subtle, um, but it tilts to the sides and the angle at which it tilts is not always X or Y, but it's like, it basically covers the 360 degrees. So I think that's going to be an interesting thing to, to showcase here. And for that, um, I'm going to explain how I'm going to do it with a sketch. Okay. So we're going to shift to sketch mode. Uh, and I had this sketch. I'm going to, wait, 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 I'm going to go here and I'm going to create a new sketch. Um, so the way we're going to do this is going to be, we're going to work with each one of the planes. And this is very important. This is why, when in the previous video, I was making so much emphasis about not working just with points, but working with planes because planes um, give us a lot of information about location and rotation. They're very nice to work with. So if we think of a plane, the way planes are represented in Grasshopper is by this kind of square that has a principal direction. That's X. That was a terrible line. Sorry. <laughs> it's very hard to do straight lines here. Um, we have the y, verse, the y direction here. And because planes are orthonormal, we have the perpendicular direction pointing outwards. That is usually not visually represented in Grasshopper, but it is there. It's information that we have. So that's the C vector, okay? Um, what we want to do is we can't use, for example, a random rotate, because what that would do is it would rotate the plane around the C vector and um, it will make the blocks not keep the alignment that they have on the grid. And we do want to maintain that alignment. So what we need to do is we need to figure out a way to, um, we need to figure out a way to uh, 
create some kind of like virtual axis, for example, something like this, at a random angle from the main direction of the plane. So, for example, this angle can be random. And um, we, may also, we may want to rotate that plane around this axis, um, also a random value. This is very hard to draw here. Also a random value. Um, so I think the easiest way to do that is going to be to take each one of those planes, take the C vector, all right? So this is the C vector of the plane, sorry, the X vector of the plane, then rotate that X vector around the y-axis a random value in degrees so for example something like whoop, uh, something like a new x vector something like this this will give us the direction sorry i'm just going to stick to the diagram that i did so rotate that vector with a random direction something like this okay and use that vector to rotate the whole plane by a random angle that will be very small in in so Let's try to let's try to do that. I'm going to shift shift back here. I'm going to take I'm going to take a detour here. I'm going to oh, oh, no, that's not what I want. I'm going to take this plane here, this collection of planes. All right, and I'm going to start working with them. So first of all, I'm going to decompose them, and I'm going to find the x vector, the main vector. So that would be. That will be the one that I specified here, so this one here. I'm going to then, for each one, and they're all the same, they're one, zero, zero, okay? You can see here that we have a data tree with all those, um, all those x vectors, but we can also see that the data tree is kind of strange because, for example, it has an empty branch here, which, due to the fact that we delete a full row of these blocks here, um, and then for each one of the branches, the number of elements is different. So that's going to make things a bit more complicated. So I guess what I'm going to do is from now on, I'm going to flatten the structure of the data tree so that from here on, I have all my vectors. I have them on one single continuous list without any branches. And since I don't really need that data structure for the rest of my exercise, uh, that's going to make my life a little easier. I will have to modify a little bit of what's going on here but it's, it's fine. So <clears throat> once I do that, the next thing I want to do is I want to generate random values for the rotation of that X vector, one random value for each one of these vectors, and it has to be different values, okay? So the first thing I want to do is I want to figure out first how many vectors do I have. So I can do that by figuring out the length of a list, so list length. That gives me the value of 238. Right now, I'm going to go to sequence and place a random component. The random component it tells me that the, first it asks me the domain that I want for the random values. Uh, it asks so by default it's values from zero to one, but um, I'm going to be working in degrees, for example. Uh, so I'm going to change this to zero to 360 degrees. If you write a domain with text and you plug it in there, it works pretty well. Okay, and since I don't want this to change ever, uh, and this is very important, I don't want to use a slider for this because if somebody touches that slider, then it's going to break the randomness of my, of my distribution. So I want this to be always zero from, from zero to two, um, to eight, uh, 360, okay? Um, how, many num how many random values do I want to generate? As many as elements in the vector, and this is the seed. The seed is basically a number that we can use to control um, the random distribution of these values. What basically this means is that each seed that we give, every, for every seed number that we feed the random, the random component, it will generate a different kind of randomness. Uh, but we, if we always go back to the same seed, we will always have the same kind of randomness. Basically, this is just a way of saying, well, I can use, for example, any number. And if I change this number, the distribution of those random values will change. So we can try like different inclinations for this for these vectors. Anyway, uh, by doing that, what I get is a list of 
random values that goes from 0 to 360, more or less. OK? Now, what I can do is I'm going to take all these values and I'm going to use them to rotate this vector around the C axis of the plane. Um, I'm going to do that. There's probably something in transform, in Euclidean, rotate 3D. Yes. Um, well, I could have rotated the object in the plane, but this is this would have been made my life easier now that I'm thinking about it. But anyway, this is now that we're here, we can just use this. So what is the geometry that we want to rotate is we want to rotate the planes. We, what is the angle that we want to rotate? I want to rotate this, but make sure that you, you see, it's already messing up. This is kind of cool, actually. Uh, but make sure that you here on A, because the input is in radians by default, make sure you right click and you hit degrees so that we stick to the 0 to 360 range. Um, then for the center, I want to use the center of each one of those planes, the center of rotation. And the axis of rotation is going to be the Z axis of each one of those vectors. OK. So that should give me all this list of vectors. Oh, actually, sorry, I'm not rotating. Well, uh, let's take a look at that. Um, where are these planes? Ah, they're here. Yeah. Well, actually, I made a mistake. I didn't want to rotate the planes. I wanted to rotate the vectors, but this illustrates. Let me make these planes a bit larger. But this kind of illustrates how now we have like. Now we have um, randomly rotated vectors around. Um, and I also you see what's happening here. This is because I have forgotten to flatten. Um, I have forgotten to flatten. Uh, so maybe I can just flatten this and then work with the planes instead like that. Uh, and then feed here these planes. That makes things better. OK. All right. But it's not the planes that I wanted to rotate. It was the x vectors that I wanted to rotate. So let me redo that again. Um, and now. What is going on here? The center is the geometry, race geometry, uh, because I need to rotate this around the center. Yes. OK. So because vectors don't have a location, sorry, um, that was my mistake. Because vectors don't have location, you can't really rotate them around the center. So they need to be rotated about 0, 0, 0. Um, and you see that now we have this distribution of vectors um, rotated around that center. I think I'm doing this overly complicated. Um, I think just rotating the plane and extracting the x vector would have made life easier for us. Um, but anyway. Um, uh, OK, so now that we have these rotated vectors, uh, so yeah, let me show the other way that we could have done. We could have done um, rotate plane around. We could have rotated the plane a particular angle around its C height and then just extracted the x vector from here. Um, maybe that's an easier way to look at this. I don't know. Well, I'm going to stick to what I did before. And then we can, because it's a bit more generic, uh, which I kind of like. Um, OK, so we have those rotated vectors. And now we can use those vectors to rotate the plane around the vector. So just like I did this, so I'm going to go back and use this rotate 3D. And what I want to rotate now are the planes. So I'm going to take each one of these planes. OK, I'm going to the I'm going to rotate it around its center. So this thing here, I'm going the axis is going to be these vectors that I have created. And the rotation angle is going to be 
a random value that I will generate in a second. But you guys can see that immediately what I'm getting is that all of this vector, all of these planes are rotated by 90 degrees. And you can see how very interestingly they're all perpendicular to the plane that they were before. But they all have this kind of like inclined angle that is part of this random rotation that we gave it. Okay. All right. So instead of sticking to 90 degrees, what we're going to do is we're going to create a new set of random values that go from, I don't know, minus two to plus two, for example, uh, or something that is parametrically defined. So for example, I'm going to, I'm going to copy this. Okay. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to create a new, this is a new random sequence. But now the domain that I want, I don't want that domain to be fixed. I want to have control if I want to have them more tilted, so very crazy tilting, or if I have that like V very constrained. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a slider here, for example, um, that is going to, to, to start at five degrees. I'm going to create a domain that is going to go from negative minus five to positive five. And then that's the range that I'm going to apply here for the random values. And here, so you can and you can see how if I decrement this, all the values like damp down, but if I make this extreme, all the values like increase in proportionally because I have not changed the seed. If I change the seed, you see that the distribution just like completely changes. So using these values, I'm going to create those planes. And look, this is very nice. If I do zero, there's nothing going on. But as soon as I start incrementing, you see how they are rotating. You see how they're rotating. The problem is that I am still using radians. So it's very pronounced. I'm going to shift this to degrees. And you see how like now the effect is much more subtle. Let me increment this to 90. But you see now how the effect is much more subtle. And as soon as I go to 90, see? All right, so I think we're good to go. So this was a lot. Um, so I'm going to, my output is going to be this box. This is something that I like doing a lot. When I have something that is complicated, but it's kind of modular. So I took all these planes and I operated them to, um, and I operated, I operated with them to rotate them. Um, I like starting and ending with these empty boxes just because it makes things easier to plug with other elements from the definition here and then. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug this back into my definition, wherever I needed planes. All right. So that was here and here. Uh, I probably want to move this to the side. And now you can see that. Ah, how nice is this? Huh? You can see that all my boxes are like slightly tilted to the side. Um, and it's actually a lot. So I'm going to decrease this value, you see, two, 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 all the way until zero. Uh, let me make this um, slider longer. So now you can see that oh, value. Two, 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 two. <laughs> this is very cool. Mm -hmm. And you can also see how because we're using the same seed, all the inclinations are if I were to change the seed, the distribution of that tilting will change completely. All right. So I'm going to stick to, for example, the value of two, which I think is subtle enough. You see, they're not perfectly aligned, but uh, they're kind of aligned, you know? All right. And I'm going to hide a lot of what we did here just because we don't need it anymore. Finally, the last thing we're going to do is we're going to implement this like detail on the memorial where the as soon as we get close to the boundary of the memorial, um, we some of the blocks start disappearing, they start fading out. Okay. Um, how are we going to do that? Well, I think that's going to be uh, a bit more like algebra intensive. Uh, but basically, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate for each one of the points. Uh, let me first 
deactivate this. So remember here we had all the points that were clean and contained. These are the ones, sorry, these ones here, the ones that have not been projected back down yet. So we're going to work with these points and what we're going to do is for each one of them, we're going to calculate the linear distance to the closest place on the curve. We're going to calculate the distance of that length and then um, what we're going to do, we're also going to implement a random rule where the smaller that distance is, the higher the probability that that block should be removed. I'll get to how to do that in a sec, okay? So first of all, let's figure out how far away these points are from the curve. What I'm going to do is, I think I'm going to go to curve and I'm going to find, um, there was like something like closest point, curve, closest point. Find the closest point on a curve to the current one. I think this is the one that I want to use. So this is the points that I want to project on the curve. And these are, this is the curve that I want to project onto. You can see here that uh, a lot of points have shown up on the curve. Those are the points that have been basically projected to the closest point on that curve. And just to make it easier to see, I'm going to draw a line. We don't need this, but I'm going to draw a line between those points and the projected points so that you guys can see where it, which one of those points has found its most proximal, its closest point on the curve. All right. Again, we don't need this line for anything. It's just for visualization purposes. Uh, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the distance between those points. That's going to be this guy and this guy. Um, and this is going to give me, uh, I'm, I don't need to see this anymore. Uh, this is going to give me a list of distances uh, between um, <clears throat> a list of distances between the original point and the projected one. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to we're going to take those distances and then we're going to implement a rule where we're going to remove points from that list based on how close they are to the curve. Okay. Um, somebody on the chat pointed out to me that I don't need to actually calculate the distance. The distance to the curve is already given by the um, project point on curve component. So this is unnecessary. Thank you for that. Uh, so here I have a list of all my distances, right? Um, so what I'm going to do now is because I want, I want to implement a rule where the closest we are to the curve the higher the chance we have of being removed, I need to somehow take these numbers, which are greater the farther away we are from the curve, and I need to somehow flip them so that for values that are very small, like this one, we have a higher chance, a higher probability of having that point removed. So I need to create big numbers out of small numbers, and I need to create small numbers out of big numbers, if you will, right? It's another way of looking at that. A very easy way to do that algebraically is to is to is by inverting those numbers. That's usually a way of inverting is nothing else than saying dividing the number one by that number. So if I now copy and paste this and I show this here, you can see that by taking the values of the distance and doing one divided by that distance, what I have done is I have generated larger numbers for from small ones and very small ones from larger ones. So you can think of this, we will use these values as the probability of the point to be removed from the, the curve. So for example, this point that is very close has a 2.3% chance of being removed from the list. Whereas this point that is very far away, 16, has a 0.06% chance of being removed from the list, which is a very low value, okay? So, and how do we apply that chance? Well, ima chance, imagine that we were throwing dice. So for each one of these numbers, we want to throw a, a dice, for example, a virtual dice, uh, with a value that goes, for example, from, one, from 0 to 100, so that we stay in this like percentage kind of, way of thinking. And then if the number that we roll is under the number that we have here, then that value should be removed. And again, because very small values give us higher percentages, it will happen that most likely those values that those points that are closer will have a higher chance of being removed. Okay. 
Um, so let me implement that. So I'm going to say first well, for random again, um, because we have the, this data structure that is not very nice to work with, I'm just going to flatten everything. Okay. Um, I don't like, I'm going to flatten, this is going to break some things down here downstream, but I will take care of that later. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to I'm just going to take these inputs here and plug them in here, and I'm going to flatten everything that's coming out of here. Okay, so now I have a clean list of points and um, and random probabilities, and now I'm going to figure out the length of this list. So how many elements, how many points are in this list? I'm going to create random values for each one of those. So how many random values? As many as points on the list. What is the seed going to be? Whatever, I don't care. We can choose that later uh, so that we can see different variation. And what is the domain going to be? I want the domain to be from 0 to 100, for example. If that's... Um, actually, I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to use a slider here in case that we want to increment the chances. Let me... I will, I, will, I will talk about that in a second. So I'm going to create a domain that is going to go... I'm going to construct a domain that is going to go from 0 to 100. I'm going to plug that in here. And you can see that the chances are these ones. So this number, blah, 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 blah. So basically, uh, right now, no number is going to be under that. So that's, uh, let me let me get to that. I'll get to that in a second. So, and then what I would do is I would check whether if the random value that I generated is smaller than this one. And if that's true, then that's what I want. And, and those are the points that I want to remove from the list. So um, I'm going to say um, smaller than is this value smaller than the probability. And this is going to give me a list of false, 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 false whatever. And then I can use just like I did before. I can take a call pattern take the whole list of points and call it by this pattern. The only problem is that, as we saw before, call for elements that are false, it removes them, and for elements that are true, it keeps them. So I need to invert the sign of this Boolean value. So everything that is false, I need to turn it to true or vice versa. Or what I, want, what I can do is, like, instead of checking for whether if it's smaller, I can check whether if it's greater. So, for example, uh, what is the, I don't know how that's called, larger than, okay, so is this larger than this, true, 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 etc, etc, and this is the pattern that I use. Um, so, I'm going to hide this, and can you see, I mean, we had two, 238, and here we had 237, so there was one point somewhere, I can't really see, that has been removed. <laughs> so something interesting is that because we have control over this domain, the domain of the random values, if we make this domain smaller, you will see how more and more values will start disappearing. You see? Ah. You see? It's very subtle, but it is, yeah. And you see how like this one is missing, this one is missing, this one is missing. I think this one is missing. This one is a bit farther away. This one is very far away. This was like a random chance. Um, but we can see how uh, there is like a bigger distribution of those elements missing uh, the closer we get to the border, okay, with this one outlier. If we don't like that one, we can just change the seed and we can see how the new distribution just gives us this random outlier. But also we remove this one, this one, this one, this one here. So I think it's working. All right. Yeah, I like it. I like this. So we're going to keep this. And this is going to be this is the clean list of points. Uh, this is the one that we should project back to the surface. And then here, we don't need to this is flattened already. So this is not going to change anything. Um, and now we can activate this again. And we can see 
this random uh, distribution. Uh, uh, and you, we have the monument and we have like they're slightly inclined and you see how here there are some gaps here and here and here and all the border is Ta -da! <laughs> should we should i get like a bell or something like dan shiftman like Ta -da! <laughs> so as we just saw uh in this second part of the video um we implemented a bit more like fine details and more nuances about how the the, the monument is 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 in reality uh, it required like a little bit of numerical manipulation and some quite some randomness because of the random nature of the um, of the of the monument But I think so far it's successful. This doesn't one doesn't look like the real thing But if I now change the scale of the surface and the plot of land, we could make it look very similar to that one. Okay um, so thank you very much for watching and um, we may follow up with a third part uh, where we where we um, where we do this, where we implement this same thing, just in purely C sharp, in one C sharp scripting, scripting component. If that has happened, you will see here somewhere a card pointing to the, that video, or you will see a link to that video here in the description of, of the video. Okay? Thank you very much.